League of Women Voters is so proud and so privileged to have John. Please help us welcome John Ingram. Thank you. I've always been impressed by the League's uh, great efforts to have informed voters, and I, again, appreciate, and we need more of that. And this series of topics from green, environmental, sustainable, renewable, climate change, sea level rise, which tend to be um, meld together in some ways. That's the green bucket. You know, we tend to put all the, everything in the green bucket, I like to say now, that, that unfortunately that everything from recycling to driving a hybrid to bicycling to work to eating organic to um, um, turning down the thermostat and, uh, and, and so on. And the problem is the green bucket really has buckets inside of it. And we need to start to separate them because they're really not all the same. I came up with a diagram a year ago. I was at a, a residence program over in the west coast of Florida with some artists. And they had the same confusion. And so they had great uh, encouragement that I should do visuals. And I came up with a call, something called Green Benby, which was a Venn diagram taking, um, you may remember that from school, where you write circles and show the relationship of subsets and so on. And this was kind of a playful exercise, but with uh, legitimacy to, to say, let's look at a variety of green issues, and then some things which are partly green, and also realize that some of the green issues are very different issues at the same time. And at the top is energy and, and sea level, are the black and the kind of blue, and we're going to dig down on that in a minute. But then everything from animal issues to uh, clean water to um, ecology, endangered species, recycling, ocean acidification, those barely overlap, actually, even though they're all green issues. And you can, you can be concerned and work on all of them. The reason I, I get um, concerned about this is the danger to me is that if you're working on one but you think it's going to affect another, we've got a problem. And that's what I really want to try and help clarify. I don't want to tell you what issues to work on, but um, I do want you to help to understand the difference. The main focus of my work is now sea level rise, which is, of course is an aspect of climate change. And people tend to be very concerned about that for good reason here in Florida, but it's not just a Florida issue. This is, as sea, sea level rises globally, it's going to have impacts all over the place, in places you've never even thought of. So you've seen various photos of flooding in Miami. This is a real photo of somebody kayaking in the streets during a, a storm event. Um, we rem may remember the four years ago, there was a, a period of time, it was the Thanksgiving storm. It wasn't Hurricane Sandy, it was a month later. It was the no-name Thanksgiving storm that wiped out four blocks of A1A in Fort Lauderdale. So things are happening different than used to happen. And it is confusing. And it's perfectly understandable that people can't conceptualize or frame or describe these things. And that's what I, I try and do. There's lots of images. This is Stranahan House. It's kind of famous because it's a really valuable, histor priceless historic building in Fort Lauderdale. When it was located on that river and with that um, steps and, and dock and so on, it didn't used to flood like that. I mean, something's happening different than happened 100 years ago. But San Francisco, the Embarcadero, I bet many of you have probably been to the Embarcadero. How many of you have been there? Well, that's seven and a half miles of waterfront. The elevation of that was established 140 years ago. And it's very clear that the fact that it goes awash every 28 days now at full moon high tide, something's different. Sea level's getting higher. And um, it's really important that we understand this problem because, and not panic, this is totally different than storms. And by the way, I didn't predict Hurricane Sandy, even though a lot of people say that. I described a superstorm hitting Atlantic City in New York as a possible scenario. It happened one week after I published my book, so that was pretty amazing. <laughs> but I never predicted it would happen, it was just something that could happen. The fact that it happened a week after the book was published is bizarre, and, and I'm the first to say that. This was an image of Hurricane Sandy, pretty famous one. 
This is a FEMA photograph that showed how the shoreline of New Jersey was breached, and it gives us a good visual of what happens, whether it be a storm, whether it be ex um, extreme tides, and ultimately with sea level rise. But the difference is the magnitude and the, um, how quickly it can happen. A storm is going to come in as we know. We can get five or ten feet of a, sea, of a storm surge in a matter of hours, right? Sea level could never possibly do that. Tides are kind of a hybrid. So it's important to distinguish them because they do add up at times, but the difference is that sea level won't go down. So we really need to, this is a whole new reality that if you'd asked any geologist uh, 50 years ago if this could happen this quickly, we would have said no. Just, this is really new territory, and it's perfectly understandable that, that everyone's a little bit confused about how to describe this and, and understand it. But I hope that by the end of this evening you will. Again, this is a doc from Delray Beach. This is happening all over, but it's not just all over South Florida. This is happening all over the world. This happens in Boston and Seattle and San Francisco and uh, London and uh, just every coastal area in the world. Now, there's some things here that make it a little bit different. But to, to start narrowing in on this climate change, which is what we're going to zero in on tonight, as opposed to the other environmental green issues, okay, we're going to single that down. And climate change, which is a narrowed part of that Venn diagram, if you will, it's not animal rights issues, it's not you know, save the sea turtle, or, you know, it, it's not... Um, um, endangered species, it's not uh, safe drinking water, okay? Climate, even though it may touch on those things, but climate change is a phenomenon that the planet's getting warmer. And what I'd like to suggest is that, and this is my own framework, but it's getting a lot of um, acceptance, that we should break climate change into four categories. The first one is greenhouse gas reduction. I shouldn't abbreviate that. That's reducing carbon dioxide and the 30 other greenhouse gas, and I'd be glad to talk about that. So that's to say that's issue one. How, the energy part, okay, reducing carbon footprints. You've heard about that, right? So let's just say that's the first part and the part we probably need to work on the quickest. The second is the direct effects of a warmer planet. And those would include record heat levels, like we're seeing third year of record high temperature in a row since 1880, since records were kept. That's a direct effect of warming the planet, obviously. Then weird weather, new patterns, unusual patterns. That's happening because of warming, and I can talk about that. Heavy rainfall, surprisingly, is an effect. As you warm the ocean, you get more evaporation, and if you get more moisture in the air, it's going to come down as rain or snow. But that doesn't mean there won't be places that don't have more drought, like California. That's weird weather when you package that all together. All of those things are direct effects of warming the planet. They happened because we have too much greenhouse gases and trap too much heat. But they're not one and the same thing. You can't push the toothpaste back in the tube, right? If you've warmed the planet, it's like, imagine you put a block of ice in a pot on your stove and you turn the heat up. Once the ice is melting, turn the heat off, the ice is going to keep melting, and pretty much no matter what you do, the ice isn't going to refreeze from a practical standpoint, right? And the third effect is indirect effects. Um, agriculture, what's going to happen, uh, diseases, pests, um, the uh, ocean acidification, the temperature, the, uh, the pH of the ocean is going to get lower and I can talk to that, that's a really big deal. That's an indirect effect of warming of the, of the climate change. And then fourth and finally is sea level rise. And it's really a unique effect of a warmer planet and less ice. I'm noticing the nodding of heads, that makes sense. But see, until you break it down that way, it's all one and the same and it's in that green bucket. And you can't do that because otherwise you're not taking a plastic shopping bag at Publix, you know, and thinking you're going to stop sea level rise or some other 
combination of things which are all good, but the treatment should try and achieve the effect you want. Otherwise, you may get really disappointed years from now to find out you put a lot of effort into something and it was another green issue. So rising sea level is unique for a couple of reasons. The first is it's slow to occur. But as the ice on the planet melts, which I'm going to show you very visually in a minute from Greenland, as the ice on the planet melts, it's effectively permanent, like the, with that simple example of putting a pot on the stove and putting a block of ice in the pot. There is no quick way to get it back frozen. The amount of cooling you'd have to do is just totally impractical this century. It's not possible, thank, frankly. It defies physics and thermodynamics, OK? So again, we just have to be honest. And to the degree we want to affect good policies or elect people to public office that will advocate good policies, we need to make sure we're not confusing the issues together. That's really the premise of tonight's meeting. Um, it's, so it's confused with storms and extreme tides, and it amplifies those things. In other words, as sea level rises, the next storm that comes to town will be just that much higher, and the next time we have a high tide event, it's going to be higher. But sea level won't go down even though the storm surge subsides and the high tide subsides. So the sea level is the very slow event as the ice melts, whereas the storm events are really sudden event and the extreme high tide is an every you know, 28 day event with the full moon and so on. It's hard to imagine higher sea level because the planet has not had higher sea level for 120,000 years. Was anybody here back then? <laughs> um, the <laughs> the uh, we have to laugh about this a little bit, you know. And I, I do that purposely. This is pretty sobering stuff. And uh, but a lot of things in life are, whether it be the medical or financial or personal. And uh, I do believe it's important to at least keep a relative sense of humor while we try and solve big problems. Otherwise, we don't try them try at all. So it's not being a uh, uh, so, you know, silly about it and, and disrespectful. Uh, sea level rise is thought of as an environmental problem, but I like to say that it's really um, a built environment problem. It's really land, a land problem more than an ocean problem. It's just a way of thinking of things. It's, it's kind of the flip side of the coin. It's the opposite, and I do it purposefully. But the truth is, I've been involved with ocean issues my whole life in the diving business and corals and, and um, with Cousteau and, and a lot of things, but um, sea level's not so much an ocean issue, it's a land issue. Now, of course, where does the land boundary meet with the ocean? And in, and in fact, by just turning that around, not only do we take it out of an environmental issue, which, you know, of those environmentalists, maybe you're all environmentalists, we probably all are in this room, but the truth is, if sea level is going to rise and take back the land, one way to get people to think about it more seriously is say, it's a real estate issue. It's a finance issue, right? And so how we frame things is just so important. Sea level rise is starting to get a lot of traction, the, a lot of attention. This was a cover or a feature story in the New York Times two weeks ago. The flooding of coast caused by global warming has already begun. Scientists' warnings that the rise of the sea would eventually imperil the United States coastline are no longer theoretical. New York Times feature story. Goes on to cite a lot of good science. What do we know about sea level? In the last 150 years, this chart starts in 1850, sea level has risen about 8 or 10 inches globally. Now, the line warbles up and down. It's not a smooth line. And actually, it's steepening a little bit, that curve, the rate of sea level rise from 1850 to now, 2010, um, 2015. The, the bumps in the line, you know, people say, oh, well, look, it's going down. But obviously, if you can look at 150 years of a trend like that, you pretty safe to bet where it's headed, right? Unless there's somebody can make an argument to you that some force has changed in 160 years. You know where it's headed, right? 
I mean, if that was a stock, you'd want to buy it, right? You wouldn't care that it blipped down last week or yesterday or last year. And that's the big picture of sea level rise. Now, that's a global average. Interestingly, sea level, it varies in different places because the land is also moving up or down. So if global sea level rose eight inches, which it did, and the land in New Orleans sank 38 inches, which it did, if you measure sea level in New Orleans, it went up 46 inches, right? And in Norfolk, Virginia, the land went down uh, 22 inches. And so when you add the global eight, it looks like 30 inches in Norfolk. And in Los Angeles, if they measure sea level, it's only four inches higher because the land has lifted up four inches. So sea level is actually different in different places, which is really a surprising concept. So most of the descriptions of sea level are about global average, but there can be a wide variety. Uh, I, know in, I don't think it's in this slide set, but I just show a dozen US cities, and it ranges from four inches in Los Angeles to the 46 inches in New Orleans. Or, yes, and um, you know, Manhattan's 14 and Miami's 12 and so on. So sea level's a relative issue because of land moving, subsiding or uplifting. Alaska, the land is uplifted so much that sea level's falling. So this is the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compacts revised chart from last December. And uh, this is a great group. It's the four counties from uh, the Keys up through Palm Beach County. And they've been doing this for, I think, seven years now of working together so that one county doesn't work on one sea level rise projection, another one works on another. It's, it's a great idea. More places should do it. And there's about 25 or 30 experts of various kinds who comprise the, the, this compact and um, try and look at all the data they can and say, for, Flo for South Florida, what should we plan on? And th they came out with the revised projections, as I say, uh, 10 or 11 months ago. And just to help you through it, so they're saying by 2030, 2060, and 2100, they're looking at three different projections, and those are curves, and I'm gonna blow it up a little bit here so you can read it more easily, that if we look at the top line by 2030, just 15, 14 years from now, they're saying the projections are between six inches and 12 inches. That's still quite a bit. That's enough to flood streets that aren't flooding now. 2060, another 30 years in the future, 14, 26, 34. And 2100, their numbers are 31, 61, 81 inches. That's almost seven feet. Now, I'm going to try and explain to you in very simple terms why there's a huge range to the numbers and why the truth is we not only don't we know, we'll never, we won't know much in advance, unfortunately. It sounds surprising. It's not because scientists are stupid and we're lying or making anything up. But the truth is there's, um, there's a reason why we can't tell you how quickly it's going to rise beyond the next 10 or 20 years. So I'd like to kind of get into that. If you look at the globe, the two places where there's a lot of ice is Greenland and Antarctica, the two big white spots, right? And there's enough ice on Greenland to raise sea level 24 feet. But that's not the worst case. Antarctica is seven times bigger. It's got enough ice to raise sea level 186 feet. Now, that hasn't happened in 30 million years that all the ice has melted. It's not going to happen anytime soon. But we do have to start understanding what is going to happen and start detangling this confusion of thinking that all the things are one and the same, because they're not. Those two places, Greenland and Antarctica, hold 98% of the world's ice. And that's on, on land. I, should, let me, I need to clarify that. Ice on land, huge difference. And I'm going to show you the other kind in a minute. You'll notice, in fact, that the area around the North Pole, north of Canada and to the left of Greenland, is blue. There's still ice up there, but it's not land, and so it has a different character, and it is melting. And you've probably seen pictures. This is an aerial view 
The North Pole is, a, is the square there right in the, in the, the crosshair right in the middle of the ice, but that's floating sea ice. Totally different. Um, so here's, you know, that's uh, Alaska, uh, Canada, Maine is down there, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, okay? Just kind of makes sense of it. It's just a strange view, I know. Um, in fact, if we just tilt it, there, there's a more normal view. I've just taken the same image. So here's Greenland now on the right. The United States kind of in the normal uh, north is vertical mode. And, uh, but if we look at the polar ice cap, that area around the North Pole, this is what it looks like. It's, it's ice that's melting. And it moves around and some places are more solid and bigger than others. But that has nothing to do with sea level rise because it's floating ice. And you can run this experiment at home. Take a glass, put some ice cubes in it. Don't, don't have them touch the bottom. Make sure they're floating. Mark the level. And while the ice cubes will be about 10% above the surface, just like an iceberg or similar, um, when they've melted, they won't change the level of liquid. It's counterintuitive, but it's true. Simple experiment you can run. It's because of the displacement. Now, it's a little different with an iceberg because of fresh and salt water, but the concept's the same. If it's floating, it will not change the level of liquid. To add to the level of liquid, you have to add an ice cube or add liquid. Okay? And we only can do that from ice that's on land. Okay? Simple lesson, but 90% of people are confused by that. The polar bear habitat's certainly an issue, and, and it's bad in terms of what it could mean for them. But we have a bigger problem with that than the polar bears. Um, the, as the bright white ice turns into very dark blue or almost black ocean, it's like taking your white roofed house and painting it black. What's gonna happen to your air conditioning bill, your electric bill? It's gonna absorb heat, right? Your house will get hotter. And so the biggest problem that comes as the melting, melting polar ice cap disappears is that the planet gets warmer, which means the ice melts faster. That's one of these feedback loops, okay? The other thing that the melting polar ice cap should really be a signal about is how profound this change is. People say, oh, well, temperatures have changed before, climate's changed before, that's true. But the last time the polar ice cap was gone was three million years ago. It's going to be gone for weeks and then months, you know, over the course of a century. Each year it'll get a little bit worse. I mean, up and down year by year. We are in a new era, folks, is the point. Now, the planet actually has had errors before, even before humans affected things. That's honest, too. So we need to get our facts straight if we're going to try and argue for or advocate policies and leaders and elected officials who can do something intelligent. But you can already see that as concerned as you are to come out this evening and hear this, and I can tell you've probably clarified some things already, most people are really confused about this, even most elected officials. So there's a lot of work to be done on this. You know what an iceberg looks like? About 85 or 90% of it's underwater. This is a photo from Greenland uh, just a, a month ago. Um, I've got a couple there. That's me with um, the head of the U.S. Coast Guard, Four Star Admiral uh, Paul Zukunft. And uh, they were there on a fact-finding trip with a senator, uh, with technically a congressional delegation. The U.S. Coast Guard has a lot of interest there. In fact, um, so I'm, I think I'm going to show you about six photographs from the Coast Guard. And um, this is an example. I don't know if you can, it's hard to tell here. This is obviously Greenland. The, the, the earthen parts, the brown here, this is from the airplane to give you a good enough view. But this gray stuff over here is ice. But what's happening is it's getting coated by the, the gravel and dust that's now being exposed after thousands of years of glaciers grinding the island down. And so the really fine powder is blowing up on the ice and making it darker, not quite black, but again, it's speeding up the melting. I hadn't seen that. It was nine years since I was in Greenland, and uh, that was kind of a new phenomenon. Um, that's an iceberg. It's floating in a fjord. If you, way back in the distance here is where it calved off 
from the face of a glacier, okay? And so as the glacier, which is a river, slowly moving river of ice on land, when it gets to the edge of the land and it breaks off into an iceberg, and the iceberg is 90% submerged, right? But in this fjord here, which is actually water, but there's so much ice that's come off the glaciers that it looks solid, but it's really not. So that giant iceberg, 10 times bigger, nine times bigger than what you see there, and it's big, uh, will get out into the ocean in about a month when it gets to, about 25 miles away. And, um, but the glaciers and the ice sheets are melting. There's Admiral Zutkamp. He's looking out, well, he's looking out at that same iceberg there, you can see. And this is really was a very um, poignant moment because that glacier, the Jakobshaven Glacier, which is the biggest on Greenland, is where the iceberg left from that sank the Titanic in 1912. And while we were there talking on August 22nd, um, I mean, just a month, a month ago, um, there's a cruise ship that was going through the Arctic for the first time. You may have heard about it. It was described in NPR and other places. And they were happy that because the ice was opening up, they could go through the Arctic. But what most people didn't understand, and even the NPR story got kind of backwards, was say, with the increasingly ice-free Arctic. Well, you would hear that phrase and think the Arctic's ice-free. There's more icebergs than ever because these glaciers are speeding up as they're melting and they're breaking off into more icebergs. And so that while you can work your way through the Arctic, it's not ice free at all yet. And in fact, there's probably more risk than ever of icebergs and will be for decades. Now, just another view of glaciers and uh, the darkness in the foreground, the, the dark gray of the glacier from what's being blown on. But I mean, we have hundreds of views. These are smaller icebergs that are out there in the shipping lanes already. And, um, Okay, so to, to shift gears from Greenland, let me give you, and this is one slide, and um, you can download this from my website. Uh, it's uh, 400,000 years of three things, a greenhouse gas, global average temperature, and sea level. And it probably is the best single picture uh, of climate. And you're welcome to use it. It's in my book in black and white, but in color it really pops out here. And let me talk you through it because there's a lot of information and it's really surprisingly simple. From left to right, 400,000 years. Let's follow the red line, which is global average temperature. And what that shows is you can see that there's four peaks, right? Four ups and downs. Those are the ice ages. The last ice age, the cold spot, was about 20,000 years ago. Can you see that from the right-hand edge here? There, that's the last ice age, what we call the ice age. Actually, we're technically still in an ice age, but in common part because there's ice on the planet. But it, what we call the last glacial maximum, but, but in, in regular terms, it's the last ice age. But what most people don't think about is not only that, that wasn't that long ago. I mean, if you think that the um, Hebrew calendar is 5,000 years, for example, and the Chinese and Turkish records go back six or 8,000 years, uh, 20,000 years ago is not that long ago. And 20,000 years ago, the Earth was at a peak ice age. Now, the last time was another 120,000 years before that. It's about 100,000 years between ice ages. The cycle's been going on for about 4 million years. So when people say, well, climates changed naturally before man impacted, they're absolutely right. No doubt about it, the ice ages. They don't know when the last one was or that there was a regular cycle of ice ages and it was a natural phenomenon. The problem is that, so, but the, the range is uh, five degrees Celsius, which is nine Fahrenheit, and it goes up and down, up and down, and the, the period changes a little bit, but it's a pretty regular phenomenon. That's geologic history. It's been in books for 100 years. Um, as the planet's temperature changes, what do you think happens to the ice sheets on land? It gets smaller, right? If it gets warmer, the ice is gonna melt. It's really simple. And if enough ice melts, what's going to happen to sea level? It's going to rise, either by ice, icebergs breaking off or just by meltwater running to the ocean. It's really no more complicated than that. The, so sea level goes up and down pretty much in parallel with the temperature, right? Up and down about 350 feet. 350 feet up and down. 
Can you imagine that? I mean, that's like as tall as almost any building in New York City. Um, and interestingly, at the top in the green is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide also moves in parallel with temperature. It's a greenhouse gas. And it has a normal range of 180 to 280 parts per million. That's the bounds of this 180 to 280. And I round everything off to make it easy. You don't need an exact number to understand concepts. And the problem is that carbon dioxide has now passed 400 parts per million. You've probably heard that figure. The group 350.org, which many of you probably heard of, is trying to get carbon dioxide back down to 350, which is seen as um, if the normal limit was about 280, it's been said that, you know, well, if we can get it back down to 350, somewhere in here, that, you know, maybe we could manage with a changed climate, but it wouldn't be too severe, is the premise of that. But the problem is that carbon dioxide is just going straight up. And I'll talk to you about the Paris Climate Accords in a minute and why they're good, but they're not the perfect solution. The big picture here is that over 400,000 years, and this has been going on for about 4 million years. It's just this, you'll see it in more detail with four cycles here. We've had ice ages. With the ice ages, sea level changes, and temperature correlates with carbon dioxide. And interestingly, without getting too technical, either one can drive the other, but carbon dioxide and, and, and temperature always go together. In some cases, CO2 goes up first and raises temperature. In some cases, temperature goes up first and releases CO2 from the oceans, and, and, but they always go together. There are some relationships in physics that do that. So um, now we have an interesting correlation. Those three things go together. And the problem is that little vertical line in the, encircled in red there. Now, we don't think that temperature and sea level are going to go up at anywhere near that rate because there's a lag time to how quickly you can melt that much ice. It could take centuries. It could take 1,000 years. We're not really sure. Um, but we're warming faster than ever is the problem. We get that data from ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica. We drill down in the ice. And just like kind of tr taking tree rings out of a tree, you drill into a tree, you know, we look through the layers. Well, the same thing here done horizontally, that as the ice, the snow is laid down and turns into ice and then pressurized ice, it traps air bubbles. In that person's, between that person's finger, there's a year of ice. And we can go in there with the micro instruments and sample that air bubble, which has been frozen intact and it's pressurized. If you drop it into water, it will hiss because there's actually high pressure air in there. And so we know it's a good air sample. And it will tell us the percentage of carbon dioxide when the, ice, when the snow crystals fell. And more amazingly, we know temperature because oxygen has two different molecules, molecules, 16 and 18. And by molecular weight, they vary in relation to temperature. So amazingly, we have a temperature record now that goes back 140,000 years in Greenland and about 800,000 years in Antarctica. So we have a record of carbon dioxide and temperature. And we can find ancient sea levels geologically. Many of you have heard about the Paris Climate Accord, which was uh, agreed in December last year and is being signed. In fact, just two weeks ago, I think, the US and China signed on. There's 196 countries that agreed to limit greenhouse gases as a way to try and limit temperature. And that's really good. But the problem is, as this thermometer shows, uh, this is the best calculation by a group called Climate Interactive. It's uh, based out of MIT, some really good physicists, and this has been validated and used by lots of different governments now as a way to project how do greenhouse gases relate to temperature over long, longer periods of time and to really simplify it so that we can all understand it, no matter what our technical background. And what it says is pretty amazing. It says that the increase in global temperature by the year 2100, um, if we did nothing, business as usual, we would get to 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than pre-industrial. Now, we've already warmed about a degree and a half. So if you net that out, that's about another six and a half degrees warmer than now. That's a lot for a global average. In fact, it's deadly, OK? Um, the goal, you've probably heard, is two degrees Celsius. They're on the, lower, the smaller numbers on the right 
which equate two degrees Celsius, the same as 3.6 Fahrenheit. I'll keep it at Fahrenheit to make it easy for Americans. Um, that, 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 I didn't mean to, that didn't sound right, but. Um, uh, um, that we've already warmed since pre-industrial, since burning fossil fuels in, in big quantities. We've already warmed about a degree Celsius or about a degree, degree and a half Fahrenheit. Keep it really approximate numbers. So if you'd subtract that from these numbers, that's what they're talking about as additional increase. So here's the problem. The goal that's been established by a big group of scientists is to say, let's try and keep the warming to an 3.6 degrees total, so to subtract the 1.6 that's already happened, that's another two degrees of warming beyond where we are today. That's the goal. Now, how many of you have set goals for losing weight or exercise or accumulating more money? Okay. You know there's a difference between a goal and what happens? You ever been there? Yeah, okay. Well, the problem is that the, propo so the, that the proposals when people go through and say, okay, if you take all of the commitments by all the countries and quantify it, that the proposals only get us to 6.3 degrees. So another three degrees almost warmer. Now, they're trying to get the goals lower and they're trying to get the proposals better and that's great and, they, and I hope they will. But here's what people haven't thought through, is even if we can reach the goal and even if we reduce the goal, make it lower, we're talking about more warming than we've already got. And that's why it's a slam dunk that sea level is going to rise. Because ice melts at 32 degrees and always will. Right? So here's you know, the good news, bad news. Is the good news is, in truth, climates change naturally. And we are part of a dynamic system. We may not have seen that. The other good news is that sea level can't rise too quickly. It's not like a storm which can show up next week or even extreme high tide flooding or, any, or heavy rainfall events, all these other problems. Sea level rise is, is going to happen very slowly or relatively slowly. That's good news, right? You, we can build higher. We can change building codes. When we rebuild a house, we can lift it up or relocate or do lots of things, as opposed to a storm or a tsunami or an earthquake or all these other kinds of things that are fairly sudden. Um, the bad news is it's unstoppable. Now, if we do the right things, we'll slow it, and that's good. Again, these are just, these are, I can tell you now, irrefutable facts, because I, I like to speak to people who are doubters, deniers, skeptics, um, of all persuasions, I've been on the Fox Business Channel, uh, just like a, you know, well, whether it's NPR or Fox, I don't care. I want to explain this to people because we need to wake up and we need to, to, to stop confusing things. And there are things we can do to slow the warming. And, but even if we do that, there are things we must do to start adapting to higher sea level. And as I think you'll agree, it's never said that clearly. And I hope that from tonight, you know, that you will go forth and explain this to others. Go to my website. I don't, you know, do anything with the names. And if you read my book or, um, and there's a Kindle version of the book for those who like, prefer electronic books. Um, there's my Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that stuff.